operations of the United States. Um, we're currently rolling it out to other regions. Um, we're also looking into afforestation, reforestation, and uh, revegetation. Uh, project work actually in the south, so not, not too far from, from Bob's neck of the woods. Um, you know, but really what we're trying to do is develop you know, sustainable and scalable methodologies that can be used not only in a U.S. context, but also globally. I actually just had a really interesting conversation about potentially using one of our methodologies in, um, in Rwanda, right? So, and that's actually a place that's quite near and dear to my heart. Um, so again, glad to be here and looking forward to, to being on the panel. I don't know if I should pass you, John. Good. I got one. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to, to be with you this morning. I'm Romain. I've co-founded CanUp uh, two years ago. Uh, our mission at CanUp is to make impact data accessible to everyone that, that needs data. Uh, today, we, we've noticed that accessing impact metrics, such as um, biomass uh, metrics or carbon metrics, is quite expensive. So our focus as CanUp is to make that very accessible through a uh, self-served platform. Uh, and to, to make that happen, we use uh, remote sensing images with a lot of uh, AI models to, to deliver us data quickly and in an affordable way. Uh, so we are a team of, of 10 people and we are we're based in Paris. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jonas Franke. I'm Managing Director of Remote Sensing Solutions, which is a uh, Germany-based Earth Observation company. Um, we are in business since 25 years and since then I mean, since the very beginning of the voluntary carbon market, actually, we are supporting uh, various projects um, in terms of carbon projects, nature-based solution, solution projects in yeah, getting the data ready, uh, doing the monitoring, doing the baselines, uh, supporting the, uh, the early uh, development of such projects uh, that could be peatland restoration, uh, afforestation, red plus projects. Uh, and nowadays we are building the MRV platforms. Um, our platform is called Verified Transparency, where we would like to give everyone the opportunity to onboard any area globally to monitor with Earth observation data on a continuous basis to get key performance indicators out of it to see the impacts of the projects. Wonderful. Hi everyone, very nice to be here. Uh, so Guillaume, co-founder and CEO of uh, Carbonable. Carbonable, we are an enterprise software designed for corporations and for funds uh, acting on the nature-based solutions uh, field uh, and, um, and, and, and that acts as a environmental portfolio manager. So our mission is twofold. First, uh, filling the gap in terms of operational efficiency with the lack of dedicated tooling right now in the market. Second, uh, ensure and guarantee the verifiability of environmental action. So to actually uh, unlock the sole required trust in this uh, sector. And so both of these, let's say, goals align with one shared ambition, which is uh, to empower the private sector to scale and operate environmental action through integrity and efficiency. Okay, thank you very much. So we might want to, you know, ask ourselves, why do we have to, to get this level of, of verification that you're going to hear about? And um, we were talking in our, our Zoom call last week about how we're going to put this panel together. And we thought that <clears throat> the, the geopolitics of carbon are, are being called out now. Um, so we, we know how important carbon is. We know that carbon can be sequestered in forests. Uh, we're all here because of forest. Um, but there have been several articles uh, over the last year and some very recently uh, calling into question uh, the entire voluntary carbon market. So, uh, you know, we, we have to be uh, transparent um, and we have to be able to prove on the ground uh, and with really really hard data that anybody could look at and and make a decision that yes they are doing what they say they're doing and that's important not only for their uh, the owners of the carbon the producers of the carbon but those who are buying the carbon credits uh, on their own so 
you know, how accurate is the data and how do we translate that into accountability and transparency. So Guillaume, I would ask you to uh, see if you could give us an introductory to that about uh, how you think technology can accomplish that. Yeah, um, so it's going to be a long introduction story. Uh, we have time. First of all, cool. So I think there are, let's say, two main issues right now in the market that actually goes in line with the second one that you mentioned is just if we take a little bit of a, of a, of distance, first, like right now to run operationally a environmental portfolio is a nightmare or is a headache for a company. You're, so first, you need to actually uh, ensure that you invest in the right projects. So you do a thorough due diligence. Um, you will also do an assessment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's already very complex. But the truth is, this is only the very first step, and then a first step of a life cycle that will last decades. So then from there, if you're a let's say portfolio manager or a company, you will likely invest in several projects. And, uh, and certifiers, which creates then uh, uh, heterogeneity in terms of uh, monitoring, in terms of reporting. Uh, you will likely have different naming conventions, different asset statuses, etc. So all of that to say, to manage all of this in one single place right now is absolutely uh, a headache. So you have like only Excel's, if at most, uh, in majority of the corporations and funds. And it's not efficient, it's not scalable, um, and uh, it's at all uh, not uh, auditable. Now comes the second point, which is even more important and to answer your question, which is the lack of trust right now. So the mistrust and, and, and just like the, the, the fear in acting, because you're uh, fearing that everything you say will be then going back to you uh, in, the wrong, in, the, in the wrong way. So how you can go over that is by being fully transparent and not fully transparent only about the results but also making sure that what you commit to what you state so that your statements as a company like we will be climate neutral by 2035 is in line with concrete action provable action so provable impact but also provable action provable planning so you can for example lock your allocation of funding for offsetting purposes only, instead of just investing in a project which actually, who knows wh how you're going to use the assets in the next uh, 15 years. So just making commitments and statements provable action. Okay. Um, Romain, let me ask you, are we at a turning point um, where we can use technology so that it's scalable, straightforward, and accessible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we think at Canop that we, we, we are at that turning point. Uh, I can maybe detail, uh, provide more details. So the first uh, reason why we are at a turning, po in po uh, at a turning point sorry, is because of the quantity of images available. So. In the past years, we used to have uh, public, public data from the NASA, from the European Space Agency. Um, now, it's gonna, we have incoming uh, actors from the new space bringing a whole lot of uh, new types of uh, data with improved spatial resolutions, with improved um, number of spectral bands, um, and with in improved also frequency. And, and that enables, in a scalable way, to go uh, more precise uh, anywhere in the world. Um, so availability of images, that's, that's one thing. It, of course, it comes with complexity. And you need to have the infrastructure to manage that. But it offers a lot more potential than the images that we had just a few years ago. And then the, the second uh, reason why we are at a turning point is uh, the incoming of uh, generative AI models and the improvement of modeling in general. Here as well, you need to have the infrastructure. You cannot work as we used to work on a per project basis, because this model requires better infrastructure, more solid um, yeah, infrastructure in place. So 
uh, these uh, these new models enable producing um, global models that are that train with billions of data points, able to predict data um, at, at the at the local level. And at Canop, what we are doing on top of those global models, we are also able to source latest techniques in AI, such as few shot learnings. We're able to recalibrate uh, the the global model with field with field measurements coming from your project, so that you increase your accuracy. You you achieve levels of accuracy that's never been possible before. So for those two reasons, availability of images plus the latest techniques in, in AI, yes, we, we are a turning point in terms of accuracy. Okay, so let me follow up with a question. Um, so if we're trying to um, regain trust and transparency, um, how often is, you know, should we be verifying uh, these projects? It, it, it depends from one metric to another. Um, and it depends from one type of project to, to another. If we're looking at, uh, at a red project, for sure you want to verify on an almost weekly basis that the deforestation is under control in the project area. You also want to verify what happens in the reference area. Now, you also, more and more, we also consider, uh, of course, the carbon stock evolution, right? And of course, that's not something you can measure on a, on a weekly basis. That wouldn't make any sense. So for that indicator, probably you want to proceed with an annual measurement. But you want this measurement to be super, super accurate. OK, so do, do our other panelists have a, a, a different time frame? Eunice? I mean, I would definitely say that uh, we can constantly monitor um, because we have two different requirements in these projects. One is uh, the reporting towards the standards or under, under which uh, kind of scheme they are running, which have certain periodical um, reviews, of course, sometimes every five years. But that doesn't help the steering of the projects. So having a DMRV, which is nothing else than a, a digital twin, a data-driven digital twin, which reflects what's going on on the ground at the moment, really helps project developers also to improve if something goes wrong. Um, for example, planting a tree is not that easy as it sounds. Um, there was a study here from in, the, in the UK that 50% of uh, all planted trees globally um, don't survive, um, meaning that if I'm a corporate and I have the, the claim that I have planted 50,000 trees in Zimbabwe for having my certain product um, carbon neutral, um, how can I really make sure that it's going to happen? The data is there, the DMRV can tell you. So we can onboard each area. If you're the corporate, you can, you can onboard the area on the platform. You can share it on your website so to the wider public that everybody can virtually visit that site and see what's happening on the ground last week, the week before, last year, and so on. So this is transparency. Um, but of course, we have to define transparency. Sometimes sharing an Excel sheet with the expenditure on planted trees is transparency, of course. But um, yeah, what is transparency? So, um, Rion, do you have anything uh, to add there on the, the frequency? Yeah, I mean, it's to go in line with what they're saying, I think it's uh, transparency is of utmost importance uh, in this field. Like, this is, as I said, like the lack of trust, I think, is what is paralyzing right now the market uh, from mm -hmm. actors to actually further invest, further uh, contribute. So, so the, the more the better. What we've created as, as well in our like portfolio management system is like you have like a status which is obviously like the ex ante status. So it's like those you know forecasted uh, assets or environmental assets in general, and then you have like verified uh, environmental assets. Those are like the two let's say commonly shared uh, uh, statuses. What we are adding into our uh, portfolio management platform is like a verified or a monitored uh, uh, state. It means, okay, uh, it's forecasted, and on, on top of that, it's been monitored. So it's currently monitored. It's not been audited in the field, but it's monitored. And that provides further traceability, further uh, transparency for both like the actual investors and for the uh, you know, external stakeholders as well. Like, okay, like the actions right now that we have funded are 
in the right path. So very critical uh, to have this. And to go back to the very first question of you know what what technology can bring, if we if we sum it up, like in our in our uh, context is like A is uh, operational efficiency. So it's sort of like coming like when you're running a business. Everyone has like, a, or either SAP or Salesforce or any other like internal uh, software. You you need it like to run operationally speaking. So that's through technology. You need verifiability through DMRVs, through uh, other like, for example, biodiversity eDNAs, etc. And you need also like trust integrity, and that comes with, in our case, uh, blockchain technology where we guarantee the verifiability and the accessibility of the data at any point of time. So you have nothing to hide, it's available, it's verifiable, and you know, it's like a, a shield against uh, greenwashing uh, uh, bashing. Okay, thank you so much. So Jillian, uh, how, do you, how do you think this applies to, uh, to all of your members? Yeah, no, I think that's, um, everything that's been shared is, is, is really excellent. And I think just a study in, in, in sort of like where transparency and accountability are, are really headed um, and how a lot of it is technology enabled. Um, in our specific case, just to ground things a little bit and to maybe share a little bit more about what we do. So we work specifically with family forest landowners um, in the United States uh, context. And um, actually before I joined AFF, I wasn't aware that around 40% of forested lands in the United States are actually owned by families. Um, but it's a very sort of distributed um, uh, you know, ownership class. And, uh, and, and to some extent, it's sort of analogous to like smallholders in other contexts, right? It's just in the US context. So in our case, if we're, if we're onboarding landowners on a grouped sort of IFM you know, project basis, we're improving the management of their forests over a, you know, a two decade period in which we're contracting with them. Over that period, on an annual basis, we'd want to utilize things like, and we currently utilize remote sensing technology um, to essentially kind of trace hotspots. So say there's been uh, too much harvesting in a particular area, we can catch that on an annual basis. Although, as you were saying, you know, we're actually doing verification um, on, say, like a three to five year um, uh, frequency. So you kind of need both uh, to maintain you know, high integrity practices and ensure that you're able to kind of, um, you know, deliver on the carbon integrity that you're promising your, your buyers and your investors. Um, but I have to say, like, it, it's, technology is getting us there, but we're not there yet. You know, you still need the complementarity, I think, as, as Romain was saying, of on-ground measurements and making sure you can either calibrate your AI, you know, machine learning and that sort of thing. There's still a role for humans, don't worry. You know, AI is not going to take over the world. but. Um, so we still need our forester capacity and, and really checking and verifying things on the ground. But um, yeah, that transparency is really critical. And I, just to some of the comments um, around, you know, the recent sort of negative press and other comments yesterday, and sort of the chilling effect that it's had. You know, we really need to stay focused on a race to the top. And and regardless of that, I mean, our starting principle is: Does the atmosphere feel it feel a difference? You know, and if it doesn't, then we need to get better. And so we're we're getting better, you know, in terms of that accuracy and the complementarity of technology with traditional kind of you know, measurement techniques. But um, the other thing I'll just stress, and you know, from a user context, is affordability. Um, you know, you can have the the best tool in the world, but if you can't afford to kind of scale it to other contexts, or if the carbon prices or if the sort of financing out there is not sufficient to support that, then um, it's just a very shiny tool, and you can't actually you know, scale it um, in multiple contexts, which is ultimately what we need, so just sharing that. Maybe, maybe uh, also. Romain? Okay. No, uh, affordability, that's something typically we, we try to focus on a lot uh, at CANOP, uh, thanks to the automation that, that we put in place. Um, no, I, I wanted to add something on, on the different types of uh, periods that we've mentioned. Of standards every three to five years and uh, yearly uh, measurement. Um, I think the two types of measurement will, will converge in the end. Um, I, I, I strongly believe that, and we have signals that standards will progressively adopt remote sensing techniques uh, for 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 crediting. Um, so we won't be saying anymore, okay, we use remote sensing yearly to do some 
checks, and then there is the audit every five years. No, the, everything will converge, and and so so the cost of every audit will will will, will get lower, and we'll be able then to uh, proceed with audit and crediting every year. And I think that's where we we need to get. Uh, the pricing is definitely a very important topic, uh, of course, particularly for the DMRV because it sounds shiny and it sounds expensive. But um, let's come back to the skepticism and scrut scrutiny of the carbon market, for example, for the Red Plus projects. They are now suffering that they didn't have a proper MRV back then, um, often, because, I don't know, the images were not there, the data was not good enough, there was the, the time series was not good enough. Uh, so they are suffering now from particularly these gaps in of technologies nowadays. Now we have the technology and it's scalable because everything is cloud-based. We don't have to download every single satellite image anymore. We can really work on a, on a very detailed, let's say, pixel level for generating data from a very tiny site. So independent of how large your site is or how many these sites is, there are very efficient processes to, to, to do that. And this also brings the price down for, that, for the DMRV. And what, you, what we have to, to also discuss is that the DMRV can also help to generate revenues, for example, for the marketing. You can do really good storytelling if the DMRV gives you a really nice, shiny tool of your, of your site. You can make use of that. And um, you can share ideas or success with your followers. And you, um, this is something which um, now with the new technology becomes a very interesting case as well in terms of pricing. I, I completely align with what you're saying, especially like on the on, 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 on the last part. Um, like the reporting aspect, and that's something where also technology can very much help. Like beyond the data per se, so DMRV, et cetera, which is key in core in reporting, you know, everything that happens on the field, uh, pictures, testimonials, images, et cetera, et cetera, gathering different type of data and making it like streamlined for investors and also like uh, end buyers and also like like the whole cycle is very key and so that's why also like uh we've incorporated like a automated like uh, reporting uh, framework within carbonable because we think like not only it's important in terms of transparency but it also just simply elevates the value of your assets of your environmental assets whether biodiversity or carbon it's absolutely key and 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 so it has a cost obviously you 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 know the more detailed your data is the more work is required and the more money is required that's that's ob like that's pretty much obvious and so that's why on our case like what we've decided and i think it, it sort of goes in line with 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 you guys is that you, you have like standardized data which is pretty cheap to get and then you have like in-depth data where maybe uh, you know, you need to actually go uh, uh, above and beyond, and which requires like premium type of of of, um, of um, uh, expenditures. So, to leave that choice to the investor, like what type of you know monitoring do you want, what type of data credibility, and uh, do you want? Yunus, just to jump in here, um, also in regard to the affordability, of course, MRV comes at the cost. Um, and um, mainly, um, also when we talk about that, that skepticism and the Red Plus projects and so on, um, I haven't seen that many projects back then that really for, have foreseen budget for the monitoring. And um, because it's, they had a periodical of five years reporting intervals and they were saying, let's first get the project certified until we think about the monitoring. It's five years ahead, so um, let's think about then, but this is then too late. And uh, with the latest skepticism, as bad as it was for the whole for, for the whole sector, uh, transparency is getting key. And this is now also kind of a paradigm change. Um, w people are thinking of MRV at the very beginning of planning a project, and hopefully also foresee a certain budget for it. And um, so that that it comes an incremental part of such project. Yeah, I, I think that's the key in in. Um in, in not thinking first about monitoring and then at what frequency are you going to do it. So um, the, the systems that I'm familiar with, SFI in the U.S. and Canada, uh, PEFC here, uh, FSC throughout the world, 
uh, are doing it on more like a three-year schedule. Um, the tree farm, I think, does on a five-year schedule in, in the U.S. And it, it's the oldest certification system around. Um, so it, it's very important to determine how are you going to do it, budget for it, and make it on a, um, a frequency that's important to uh, all parties concerned, not only the investor, uh, the producer, but also the, the skeptic, because we know they're out there. If I, if I may jump on this, because I find it fascinating, is like, when you look at like the, let's say, the quality, what, what is the DNA of a quality project? Monitoring is definitely part of it. It's not, it's not one, it's not the single piece, but it's definitely like crucial to incorporate it as part of the budgeting of your strategy. Second is also like, what is the return for um, local communities? If you're, you know, if you're funding, for example, like uh, uh, projects in, 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 in tropical regions of this world, like likely what you want is like the local communities to be involved because that's how the project is going to be sustainable during the, the 20 years or 30 years. And you have to incorporate it as well as part of your budgeting. So those are just pieces all combined, if you aggregate also just like the overall like uh, operational cost and whatnot, those are all the steps and all the, the, the bricks that you need to incorporate into your strategy. It's an essential piece of the wall. If you miss it, like your wall is more fragile, pretty much. Okay. You have a I, was, <clears throat> I was just going to make a quick comment on permanence and, and just the criticality of, of having an affordable solution, you know, like I mentioned, if you've got a multi-decade long contract with, in our case, a landowner, what happens after 20 years? You know, what happens after 30 years when you don't have legal access to the land, but you want to make sure that, you know, there aren't major reversals. So just making you know, that point there. Also just to say, like, we really welcome, maybe don't call them skeptics, but constructive criticism, right? Because to make something better, you know, you really need to look hard at it. And so just from our side, we really welcome, um, you know, both the innovators and the collaborators. So we, we would love to collaborate, you know, or if there's, um, you know, any, any obvious sort of gaps in this, you know, just welcome all of this sort of uh, peer group improving it because we're not there yet, but um, we really have to work together to kind of, uh, to get as good as we can, as fast as we can. Romain? <coughs> Maybe to conclude on, on affordability, the good news is that we're here. We're here, almost. Um, if you look at the situation a few years ago, every monitoring piece was project-led. It took time from a few people team, and minimum price of the retainer would be 10, 20, 30,000 uh, dollars. It's not the case anymore. Um, we already, at Canop, we've published our pricing, so our pricing model is fully transparent. You can uh, see that uh, from our website. And with some certain level of commitment, you can already get MRV for a few cents per hectare. And that's, that's where we are today. And in the near future, that will probably be even lower, or maybe with more metrics on biodiversity. But, but we are uh, at a stage where MRV is now accessible. It, it's reality. Um, so that's, that's important, I think, to, to mention. Okay, so if, um, if we had an investor who had uh, become not in, in um, purchased carbon credits, um, but who was interested in it, it, was being pressured by uh, stockholders to do so, but had read the press over the last several weeks or last year or so, um, for each of you, how in five minutes or so, how, how do you talk to that investor about um, how you regain that trust in, in using technology to do that? Well, I'll start. I think like it, 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 it's sort of the obvious, but it's de-demonize de climate action. That's the very first step, is to say, okay, let's, let's go to basics. Let's see what science says. Let's see IPCC. IPCC clearly stated there is no pathway to net zero without removal, period. There's none. Like, they've, you know, like, it's just scientific. There's none. So, first step. So, we need it. Then, you know, how do you go from we need it to we trust what we're funding is, 
okay, first equip yourself with like the right tools and the right, let's say, partners along the way. Like this is not like a one-man show. This is like okay, you will need help on the, um, you know, uh, fun like. Uh, screening and, 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 and sourcing of the, the right projects, then you will need to actually have the right tool to monitor through uh, the lifetime of the project, et cetera, et cetera. So having just the, like to report efficiently over time. So you will need the right uh, elements. If he's still fearing that, you know, uh, this is not like enough, uh, y that's where you provide with concrete examples. And you're like, okay, those are, you know, concrete tangible projects, those are the reports that are existing, those are the data, those are what you can provide then to your stakeholders, whether internal or external. So it's coming back to the facts, uh, scientific facts, and to the, let's say, innovation facts also, that now it's, l it's less complex than it was, and it's more thought-worthy than it was. But you need to actually follow the right steps, and you need to be equipped with the right tools. also getting kind of this data in action. So um, we are al al always talking about best practices. So for example, the investor could, could see some of these best practices to really show a DMRV system for a project that really does, uh, does good, which has a huge impact, but also showing projects that um, are doing worse pra practice, I would say. It's very important to learn from. Um, because just let him know that um, the MRV systems are there. We can actually see every kind of single piece of the land on, 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 on Earth because we have continuous data and we can, in the meantime, make use of it. Finally, we are here. Finally, we can make use of it. And um, this can be monitorized, actually, also by making good use of these kind of technologies in the projects. And doing all these due diligence that we are doing for the different corporates and investors, we are seeing these good and bad projects and we can measure it. And um, yeah, so don't be afraid of MRV, I would say. Uh, I'd say that uh, Rome, first Rome hasn't been built in, in a day, right? It takes time. Uh, it's a whole new industry. It's a whole new um, approach. So yeah, it, it takes time. There are mistakes. It's expected. I, I doubt we can find any industry who created an entire new class, asset class, without making mistakes. So, uh, but of course now we know. Uh, now we need to, to 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 get it done in the right way, and that's where we are now. So, and and as Guillaume mentioned, we need to nature. Nature is is one of the solution. Uh, depending on from studies to study, it's expected to to sequester and avoid between three and five gigatons per year, which is uh, a large number, right? So, so we need to, to leverage uh, nature to, to help solve the, the climate change. So now let, let's do it uh, the right way, and DMRV is clearly here to, to support those e efforts. Um, that's what I say. I guess I, I, I don't want to repeat any of the great words that have been said, but I would just say, what's your option? Do nothing. We see what's happening, you know, in, in the case of uh, that huge storm that happened in Texas where there was so much uh, freezing events, it was shutting down power for everybody. That wasn't forecast to happen for over 70 years from climate models, you know, and we see every day, day after day, you know, more and more extreme events. So, okay, you don't want to get into carbon markets. What's your solution? What's your, what's your alternative? So let's make what we're trying to build together as good as it can be, let's work together, you know, and, and be constructive about it and stay focused on, on that objective. Because I think we all, you know, can't afford for this not to work. <laughs> and the very last point that we often use when you talk to uh, leaders is when they're, you know, doubting is like a little bit in like what you were saying is like there is no choice or there will be soon be no choice anyway, like even legally speaking. So First, like ethically and morally, I think it's an emergency. We are all facing an emergency. We need to act. Do you, so do you want to be a leader or do you want to be a follower? That's, that's pretty much like the question that you can ask also to those leaders. Is, is, is this is going to happen anyway. So now act, don't wait. Uh, there is also a financial pressure that is going to come in the next few years. We all know that it's already at a certain cost, but we all know that in the next you know, years or decades, it's going to be much more. So be proactive, 
act already, learn from it, and improve along the way. Yeah, I think some great points from the panel. Um, science is experimentation. It is trial and error. We make mistakes. We learn from those mistakes. We move on. We try to develop better practices on top of best practices. Um, and I think it's also great um, to show the worst examples. You know, this is how it was purported to have been done. It should have been done another way. This is what you need to look out for. Um, if you show uh, investors the good side as well as the bad side and uh, how that can be improved, I think that does make a difference in the long term. So um, we uh, do have uh, plenty of time for questions uh, from the audience, uh, if there are any. Um, I would ask uh, the audience a question, and that question would be, if, if you're an investor or just put yourself in the, in, to the role of the investor, um, and after hearing what has been said here, would you be more comfortable entering into a carbon project than you were, let's say, after you had uh, had your coffee one morning and read the, some of the articles that have come out uh, in the last couple of weeks or the, over the last year? Uh, would, would this discussion this morning have allayed your fears? So if anybody wants to answer that question as a member of the audience or as an investor, or if you have a question, uh, we'll be glad to take them. Yes. We have a mic up here. Yep, yeah, or you can have mine. <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. Um, really good um, panel and presentation, so thank you. So, um, my name is Danielle Mulder. I am the Director of Sustainability at the BBC, um, but I also sit on the a board at Natagal, and we have projects. If you've heard of Natagal, they make investments here in the UK in nature based solutions and nature recovery projects. Um, just interested to know, I think technology is the enabler, uh, to, to go back to your question, does, does it in, instill a little bit more confidence in the market with technology coming into play? I think it will do. I think it'd be really useful to have all those data sets and we can connect them and we can start having um, some references and, and um, you know, because the measurement systems still are not settled in my, from my perspective. And you can measure with one particular methodology and it will derive a completely different set of results from another one. So that's the problem we've got, the complexity of it, I, I believe, anyway. But I'm really looking forward to the, the, you know, how the tech evolves on this and really enables what the true specialists in the space, which, are, you know, are the ecologists and, they, and they, 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 they need to be on these projects and they play an absolute pivotal role in, in getting this right. But is there a product out there at the moment? Because what we're playing with the concept of at Natagal is um, to use technology as a digital twin concept. So we play around a lot with the design of a particular project, as I'm sure lots of people do, in terms of the habitats and the interventions <laughs> that you're going to make and the, gener and the types of credits, like BNG credits through Natural England, but also biodiversity voluntary credits and carbon credits. And it seems that you can make different choices and different interventions to drive a completely different design. It's like design schemes, isn't it, of a particular plot. Um, is there a product you could name that could help us do that to actually sort of give us a digital twin that we could play around with the options, um, that we could play around with the interventions and, and then make choices and, and also play around with different reference sites as well? And be, you know, just a list of those products and how expensive they are, I'd be really interested to know. Thank you for your question. So here are the technologists. Um, what answers do you have for this, this qu very, very good question? Excellent question. Um, so on our side, I mean, like, not that we are exactly the digital twin. What we're doing is literally, like, constructing the database of all metadata relevant to the very project and to the very environmental assets that are underlying this project. So it's capturing all this data in one single source. Instead of having, like, you know, project one with monitoring one and, 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 uh, and uh, um, reporting two and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and project two and project three and, and above and beyond is grouping all, making it all in one single database and not only a single database that is private, we're actually public. It's open source and it's decentralized. By doing so, what you add is actually a source of 
absolute trust. Like, go ahead, check, traceable, transparent. You can see what has been happening, why the choices have been made, etc. What was the plan? How it is today? What's the delta between the plan and today? And what caused this, etc. So I think this is one piece of what you're trying to achieve. Then the modeling aspect, I'll, I'll let the experts uh, answer the, the question. Um, I mean, Digital Twin has uh, many ideas. Uh, for, for example, you are mainly interested then in projecting things. Like, for example, if I do that and that intervention, what will be there in 20 years? Something like that, yeah. I mean, of course, um, this, is a, this is something that can be implemented as long as there is spatial data for it. Yeah? Everything which is spatial data can be integrated in a, in a Digital Twin. For example, um, in Germany, we have the problem that we thought our forestry sector is really doing good, and then we experienced a really severe drought over several years, and we lost about 5% of our forests in Germany. We had never expected that, really sudden. Now we are, have the problem that we have to reforest everything, and we don't know which tree species to plant, because under the really dry climate. And this could be then, on a digital trend, be implemented with the different scenarios, climate scenarios, in the, in for. 1.5 to 2.5 to 7.5 scenarios to assess what would be the forest conditions in 50 years. So that I already have now a decision what kind of tree species are, let's say, for the permanence, um, wise to, to plant. This is something that can be done, but let's say there is no operational EMRV with projections yet available, I would say. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, yeah, indeed, there is no operational tool, uh, and if you need to to project, you need to go through mission-based projects at the moment. But we are at, uh, at a point where we gather more and more data, building digital twins, and in the years to come, yeah, there will be platforms to 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 project. But of course, there is a big unknown: is how fast climate changes, and so. so you mentioned scenarios, but I think that, that that's key here. It's it's gonna it's harder and harder to to predict the future from what we see uh, every every day. So I, I doubt there will, there will be one platform at some point that gives you know the the, the, the future true. It won't. Yeah. I was gonna add a, a twist to that martini. Um, I don't drink martinis, but <laughs> <laughs> my friend does. Um, and that's just what's another unknown is human behavior. You know. We can try and predict ecological, you know, and simulate ecological response to climate and um, all these different things. We can backcast and look look at previous management, but you know, nobody predicted COVID in a U.S. context. Nobody predicted what would happen to wood markets, you know, in the context of COVID. So, it's just to say, uh, you know, the future is uncertain. It's not to kind of like put a blanket on on the idea. I think simulation and modeling is good. Um, in terms of data, again, from a user perspective. What's valuable oftentimes to us is trying to find those attributes and data that is driving, uh, you know, in, in our case, family forest uh, landowner behavior in terms of harvesting behavior. So the more we can kind of understand how people are interacting with their landsca landscapes and what's driving those interactions, um, just adding that to the kind of you know, additional what needs to be modeled and considered uh, when you're looking at kind of future options. But um, it's it's a really good practice. To simulate what those futures could look like and build on, you know, it sounds like all the work that we're doing. Yeah, I think that's a uh, great point, Jillian. Let's let's not leave out the human factor um, because it's, it's always the wild card. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Got two questions. Okay, one over here and, and one here. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Agnieszka from Equino. Um, I think it's a very valid point that in order for credits themselves or for the credit market to regain trust, we definitely need those digital solutions which will improve the monitoring, verification, also hopefully measurement. But my question is exactly to the measurement point because first of all, we need to ensure that the solutions themselves are accurate enough in terms of measuring carbon. And while tracking, let's say, forest canopy to check whether the forest is still there or not is probably relatively easy. I mean, nothing is really easy, but <laughs> relatively easy. Things like the actual biomass growth for 
reforestation projects, not mentioning some of the other types of projects like sorb carbon, etc., are incredibly difficult. So my question is, where are we in terms of that measurement accuracy compared to uh, the traditional methods of, of measuring carbon, at least maybe across a couple of most important project types? Um, I, I can I can take that one. Um, we we have teams like working on a daily basis on improving uh, accuracy because indeed, if we want standards to adopt such approach, it needs to be accurate and that needs to be proven. And the way we can prove that is by when when building the algorithm and building the models. When you, it's important to leave out a certain amount of data, ground truth, field measurements that you will be use that you will be using to check once once the model delivers data to check against those field measurements that haven't been taken into consideration to to build the models uh, and what what we see so so in terms of accuracy of course the result will depend from one type of ecosystem to another uh, it, it also depends on the number of available images that you have on the area but in terms of accuracy Roughly, I'd say 10% or so. Uh, but we have, we, we also, it's important to keep in mind that even the field measurements are imperfect. It's it's, it's way it's way imperfect. Uh, the way it's done in a traditional manner, um, we will probably gain accuracy as well on the training data and field measurement by using a lot more lidar, whether it's uh, aerial lidar that we use more and more, but I'm, I, I also think about terrestrial lidar, working in, 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 uh, in on the project and then uh, measure all the volumes, plus identifying tree species, then uh, applying the right allometry relation. Then you can uh, get really accurate in terms of uh, field measurement. But until we're there, in a scalable way, we have to keep in mind that the data we're using to train and to check the models are are the data that we can get. So we need to stay humble. Maybe I can add something here. So what we always suggest um, projects is particularly when it was about afforestation, the ground-based surveys are very important, particularly in the first years. So the first two, three years, I would only care about tree mortality. So go to the field and see if the trees are surviving. And from th th uh, three, uh, year three onwards, you can think about like using drone data, satellite data to identify disturbances, like because you don't want to get a fire going through or whatever can happen, human factors. Um, and then, let's say in the long term, you can measure biomass because the tree is growing slow, and um, there's not much biomass in the first five years that accumulates in terms of and also the carbon in in the biomass. So it's a kind of a continuous mix between field-based monitoring, uh, remote monitoring, um, and later then also DMRV. So one is not working with the other, particularly for the afforestation project, I think. If I might just add something, it's also about comparability. So not relying necessarily on one very single source, potentially. You can compare the different sources, and then uh, the truth might very well be in between you know, the different sources. That that well, it's at, at least uh, on our side. Like uh, I think, indeed, like DMRV, it's at a stage where it's de developing a lot, but there are still differences between the different providers. And when you're not the expert of the modeling of you know the the the, the reporting, how can you assess whether it's the right or not? So, actually, comparing and making sure that you know you have like data that is solidified by different angles is also a, a very important solution, I guess at this stage. Okay, thank you. We have one question over here, I believe. Hi, thanks, uh, guys. Uh, Spencer Rode, I represent EarthBank. Uh, we're a nature-based solutions provider with uh, in-house uh, digital MRV tech, and it's great to, and encouraging to hear, you know, uh, similar reasonings and uh, technology being developed. Because as you said, trust or the lack of it at the moment is a key component that's holding back much needed scalability. Uh, and this is not just a question to the panel, but the wider audience here. Um, you know, we, we're all here because we're in the industry, have an interest. And you know, like our 
uh, social network feeds like LinkedIn probably are similar, if not the same. So we're probably in a bit of an echo chamber. Um, so my, my question is, how, how do we raise greater awareness, as in make it mainstream, a part of the everyday conversation, so to speak, uh, about th this new technology, the um, potential to increase integrity, etc., in uh, conjunction with all the work the ICVCM have done and so forth, because I don't think that awareness is part of the um, is it out there in, in the wider society, so to speak? Yeah, how, how do we get the, the message out to, the, to I, the broader public? It's a very good question. I think there are excellent signs, especially in Europe with the CSRD, which is actually like uh, strengthening like the you know, disclosure of extra financial uh, reports. So it will actually, I think personally, law will definitely increase and accelerate the, 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 the movement. Because as I was saying, plenty of actors right now are just like waiting for that compliance or waiting for that law before moving because it's scared of the lack of trust. So when it, they will have to, anyway, they will have to. So they, they will move. So that's one very first uh, obvious, let's say, answer. Second one is like on the trust side, is both, what I was saying, is both verifiability in terms of like impact and both accountability between what you say and what you do in terms of like managing your assets. Uh, clear example of that is, for example, Apple with the Mother Earth, um, you know, um, video, which I guess comes from a right, let's say, they, they did it because they did a lot of efforts and they did it because they wanted to showcase this effort. They did it in a way that is, to my standpoint, not perfect at all, if not problematic, with you know, stating that, okay, we are, we are on track to be climate neutral. Showcase this, prove it. What, what shows it? Where are the facts? Where are the reports? Where are the, you know, like the data? And, and so providing data transparency through the entire, let's say, execution of your strategy, for me, is key and will actually grant, like, if such a leading company does this in a very outmost transparent way, I think that, that could be, for example, a, a key accelerator as well. Okay. Romain? Yeah, maybe to, to add on that, um, we also need to have the technology to enable all the reporting that, that you mentioned. And what we have to do is not to work through PDF reports that are sent here and there over emails that clearly won't help uh, transparency and, and integrity. We need to, to work in a, in a more scalable manner. So all those data providers and platforms needs to be interconnected. And I think that, that connection is, is a key piece, actually. We need to, to be good at assembling the data. Uh, one of the tools, of course, that is uh, is using APIs uh, to to ensure that that we can uh, take the data and, and assemble that in a, in reports. That also using API is also a way to facilitate the the access the, uh, to the details for the general public. Like if you're a corporation, you have action in Uganda, for instance, you might want your stakeholders to look into the very detail of, of your action and providing this level of data is only doable if there is an API that provides the, the, the data, right? So that, that's a key piece of, of to, to enable that. that. And, and I couldn't agree more with everything you're saying and that's why also like... Thank I, you. It's, it's a personal opinion but what, what we're doing is open source and decentralized because that also adds on is is it's not a private database that only you know like your very niche or uh, corporate like uh, set can can see is like it's publicly openly accessible and that that to our standpoint there is no other way if if you want to gain trust there is no other way than to make it like really public. You have one minute. I, I was <clears throat> just going to share maybe a different perspective in the sense that I agree with, with what's being said, but I think climate 
uh, science communication has suffered for many years from a lack of kind of communication experts. So, uh, and I'm not a communication expert to be very clear, but from our perspective, you know, a lot of times, and again, we're working with family forest landers, telling stories and telling stories in an understandable way um, and just kind of picking up the point of, I don't know, shiny objects and pretty pictures, you know, a picture can tell a thousand words. And if, if you can tell um, a kind of a, a, a human story with, you know, pictures that make sense to, to the broader public and they can connect with their lives, like I think you're going to get a lot more uh, traction and, and sort of understanding within that public context because they're not going to be looking at PDF reports or Excel submissions. People don't. Yeah, do that. So, <laughs> if you can explain it to your kids, you know, with a story, you know, and, and have some pretty incredible, um, you know, and transparent kind of pictures to go along with that, that might help. But um, Channel 4 is here too, right? So just telling stories in understandable ways and platforms that people are listening to, I think there's a lot to be said for, for that. Just one last sentence, and don't expose the wider audience with expert tools. So the MRV tools can be used for expert steering <laughs> projects, but um, we should expose the wider public with intuitive, self-explaining systems. Then you have an impact. Um, so meaning, don't be too complex. Ease of use and ease of understanding, definitely. <laughs> Key for mass adoption. Okay, thank you so much for uh, listening to our panel, and we are out of time, and uh, to the panelists, thank you for your hard